So um, thank you for joining us today for this interview with John Crawford. Uh, John is a wildlife ecologist with the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center um, in East Alton, Illinois. And a lot of his research uh, surrounds uh, herpetology, so amphibians and reptiles. And I just want to kind of turn the the screen over to him and let him talk about what he does. Sure. Uh, so I've been a wildlife ecologist at uh, NGREC for about six years. Um, in that time, I, I have two major components to my research program. So I oversee the wildlife com wildlife ecology component there at the, the field station. Uh, the first re revolves around threatened and endangered species, both at the state and federal levels. Uh, so one of the projects that I've been involved with for quite some time uh, with collaborators at the Illinois Natural History Survey uh, involves the Eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, uh, which is a federally threatened species. There's actually only one uh, population left in Illinois, and that's at uh, Carlisle Lake. Uh, and so that particular population falls on both uh, state and federal land. So it's on both Illinois Department of Natural Resources property and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers property. And so we've been involved with a number um, of different issues surrounding the Eastern Massasauga and its, its conservation. Um, it first started with radio tracking to get an idea of where those snakes spend their time um, in the active season, in their hibernacula, um, mating seasons, when the females actually give birth, um, all sorts of fun things like that. Um, so that involved tracking individual snakes. Now that took place from about 1999 uh, until about 2008. Uh, at that point, we shifted towards a um, capture mark recapture program. And so we still go out and we do spring surveys every year. Uh, that's the best time to capture those guys um, right after the spring burns. And so they're a prairie adapted species. Um, they spend the majority of their time in crayfish burrows. Uh, and so after you have those prairie burns, as you can imagine, it's a lot easier searching for a snake when there's no tall grass around versus when there is. And even if you were to walk through that tall grass, what's interesting about those Massasagas, you know, rattlesnakes kind of get this, this, this bad, uh, bad opinion of them that they're going to attack people, they're going to go after people. Most of the time, they won't even rattle. You could step on one and you wouldn't even know it. They're very cryptic. They're very shy animals. Um, they don't get all that big for rattlesnakes. And so uh, a good size adult's about three, three and a half feet uh, for a female. Males will be a little bit smaller. Um, and so we continue, as I mentioned, with conservation efforts uh, in conjunction with Illinois DNR and the, the Army Corps of Engineers to protect that population. Um, one other thing I would mention about that, that population, and this isn't unique to Illinois, uh, it's becoming a, a bigger issue with um, snakes around the world is something called snake fungal disease. Um, and so if anybody, if people have heard of uh, white nose syndrome in bats, we know that that's had a large, large impact on bat numbers driving them down. Snake fungal disease is a lot like that, where snakes will pick up this, this infection, they'll get these lesions, they have a hard time clearing it, and eventually it will cause mortality in those individuals. Um, and so that's another issue that we're, we're dealing with in that population for conservation um, of those critters. Uh, the, another state listed snake that I work with are um, called Kirtland snakes. Kirtland snakes are not very well known. Um, they're also a prairie adapted species. Historically, they would have been found throughout the Grand Prairie region of Illinois. Um, however, with our loss of prairies, uh, they're restricted to those prairie remnants. Um, they're listed in most states that they're found in, and they're a candidate for federal listing. Um, so I co-advise a graduate student who's doing some work um, trying to identify new populations. And so we do some, some predictive modeling, and then we go out and check sites that have uh, potentially suitable habitat. And then we also do mark recapture with uh, extant populations to get a better idea of, again, what the population dynamics um, of those critters look like. Um, at heart, I'm mostly a salamander guy. Uh, and so that's what I did my PhD work on. And that's still what takes up the vast majority of my time. Uh, my salamander work is split uh, between the state of Illinois and a project out in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. 
Um, so I've been working on salamanders in the Southern Appalachians um, since my PhD started, uh, work started, and that was in 2003. Um, so I'm dating myself a little bit. But the, the main reason that, that I choose to work out there um, is the diversity of salamanders in the Southern Appalachians. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize first that we even have these cool salamander animals. And so a lot of people will confuse them with lizards. Um, lizards are reptiles, so they have scales. They're not uh, slick, slimy. Um, salamanders, they're basically just frogs with tails uh, at the end of the day. But in the Southern Appalachian Mountains, that's the center of diversity for salamanders in the world. And so a lot of people don't realize the only other place you can go on this planet would be into Southern Mexico, Northern Guatemala to find someplace even remotely close to what we see in the Southern Apps. And so if, if I were to take you to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, I could show you 15 or 20 species of salamanders in a couple of hours without trying too hard. Um, so one of the things that we got really interested in with the National Park Service and Great Smoky Mountains National Park was the impact of climate change on those salamanders. Uh, because the cool thing about the, all those, almost all those salamanders out there is unlike most other vertebrates that live on land, they don't have lungs. And so they require cool, moist, uh, high quality forest environments in which to persist. And if they start to lose those, they'll disappear off the landscape. And so as you can imagine with climate change, as the climate warms, they're gonna be forced further and further up the mountain. Well, at some point you hit the top of a mountain and you got no place to go. Uh, Cause you're not like a bird, you can't just fly away. So. We started in 2012 with the Park Service in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, actually just setting baselines, figuring out what they have, where, how abundant they are, uh, good times to survey for them, things such as that. In 2016, the fall of 2016, there were mass wildfires in the eastern U.S. And so the western U.S., gets a lot of pub for their wildfires and rightly so, uh, the amount of land that they impact. But there were quite a few in, in 2016. And in fact, Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, had some fires break out after an extended period of drought. And it burned about 17,000 acres of the park. Um, now, it, what happened was a lot of our long-term plots were burned. And so we actually had pre-burn conditions. And so we were able to assess the impacts of wildfire on those salamander populations. And so we continue to work with the Park Service um, and we go out there every year and we run these surveys to give them a, a, an idea of the resources they have, but more importantly, to start putting conservation and mitigation plans in place. And so figuring out how they can create more corridors for movement of salamanders, how they can better manage their habitats for salamanders. Um, so generations to come, will still be able to go out and, and check those animals out. I would highly encourage anybody that's never been to go and take a night hike. If you wander around on a trail at night with a headlamp, you will see salamanders everywhere. And I'm not talking about just on the forest floor, they actually climb and so you'll see them climbing up into trees on all sorts of vegetation. Um, it's a really, really neat experience um, that, that, that everybody should, should actually be able to get to, to get to experience at some point. Moving back to the, the Illinois part of the, the country, one of the huge things that uh, two colleagues at the Natural History Survey and I have been working on, so Andy Coons and, and Chris Phillips, is the efficacy of created uh, vernal wetlands uh, for amphibian conservation. And so for people that don't know, vernal wetlands are basically, for lack of a better term, mud puddles. So these are wetlands that should dry up every year. They're ephemeral, so they should fill up in late fall. They'll hold water until about July, August, and then they'll dry out. The reason that's so important for amphibians is that permanent bodies of water will have fish and amphibians and fish are largely not compatible. Now there's certain species like bullfrogs and American toads, things like that, that can persist with them, but more sensitive species can't. One of the issues we run into, and again, this isn't just an Illinois problem, it's a nationwide problem, is that vernal wetlands don't have any type of protection at the state or federal levels. They're too small um, for regulation under the Clean Water Act. And so a lot of state agencies are interested in trying to restore these critical habitats on the landscape because they've largely been removed. In Illinois, we've lost over 95% of our original wetlands in this state. Um, and so one of the key goals is to try to put some of those back on the landscape. 
And they're not just important for amphibian conservation. They're important for clean water. Uh, they're important for other species of wildlife, whether you're talking about macro invertebrates or shore breeding birds, um, other game birds such as ducks and, and other types of waterfowl. But amphibians are really good indicators for these habitats because they rely on both the aquatic portions to so the wetland itself and then the surrounding terrestrial landscape. And so one of the things I always try to impress upon people, and, and I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't, um, a biologist at, at uh, the Savannah River Ecology Lab uh, at the University of Georgia, Dave Scott, once was talking about wetlands. And he said, the interesting thing about wetlands is that for a good wetland, you really can't have the wet without the land. And so what he really means by that is wetlands are just a reflection of the terrestrial landscape in which they're embedded. And so if you put a wetland into a cornfield, well, it's not going to function because it's not surrounded by appropriate habitat. But amphibians use both that aquatic and terrestrial habitats, so they can tell us a whole lot about what's going on um, in those systems and if they're working. And so we focused um, our efforts early on on assessing uh, created wetlands in East Central Illinois, and so we assessed approximately 80 of these uh, that were, again, put in by Illinois DNR on, on public land. So this was all a, a public land project to get an idea of, you know, how big do they need to be? How deep do they need to be? Where do they need to be? How many of them do you need uh, to determine if they really work? What we ran into is something that, that's really kind of new to restoration ecology. And restoration ecology is a new field. It's not like genetics or evolution or cell biology. It's really in its infancy. And one of the, the problems we run into in restoration ecology is we have a whole lot of people that want to, want to do things and they want to make a positive impact, which is great. And that's, that's super important. But sometimes we can get ahead of ourselves and we do things without stopping to think about what the potential ramifications are. So in other words, when we think about this, we assume that restoration pra practices are going to have a positive effect. And if they don't, then we make that assumption of, well, it didn't work, we'll move on to something else, that, that it, there's a net zero effect, there's no negative effect. That's a dangerous game, especially with something like an ephemeral wetland, because if you put that on the landscape and it doesn't have the appropriate hydro period, so let's say it dries too early, you draw in breeding adults, you have larvae in the pond, but they don't have long enough to make it through metamorphosis. And so all of those individuals die. And so ultimately what you've done is create what we call a sink on the landscape, a population sink. So it's really critical that we understand how these, these restored habitats function. Um, and so we are still working on this issue. So it, this is one of those things people will get a little frustrated where they, they say, well, after three years, haven't you figured it out? Unfortunately, it's not a quick solution and it's not a one size fits all solution. We want functional solutions for a suite of species, not just one particular species. And so we take what's called a community approach. So um, with a whole host of technicians and, and graduate students, we've really been digging into the fine scale details of the population dynamics. So not only do we get animals breeding, but do we have what we call successful recruitment? And that's just a fancy word for saying, do little babies come out of the pond? Does that wetland hold water long enough for them to be able to come out of the pond to give them a chance to grow up, become adults, and then go back to that pond and carry on their function? Um, but as you can imagine, it's tedious and it's time consuming, but we are making some progress and we're getting, we, we've already, you know, made a lot of headway with DNR on how they create wetlands and where they put them. And now we're again getting into this fine, the fine scale stuff of, okay, wetlands not working quite right. How can we better manage that wetland so it serves the purpose that was intended to serve? Ideally, then, what we'll be able to do is transition that to private landowners. So individuals that are interested in putting um, wetlands for conservation purposes on their land, again, we can do that for multiple purposes, where it benefits things like waterfowl, and it benefits amphibians, and it benefits dragonflies and damselflies, so we can have a really functional, functional wetland. Um, 
so a whole lot of information in a, in a short period of time is probably like drinking out of a fire hose. Um, but the, the long and the short of, of, of what my program and my collaborators that I work with try to do are come up with conservation solutions for these, these critters that don't get quite the pub that birds and, and mammals get, those furry and feathery creatures that everybody loves. We sometimes overlook these more important lower vertebrates that are that really, really play a key role in in the food webs, um, and and we can't have some of those those cuter and more charismatic um, animals without the, the the ones that that I work on. Although I would argue they're just as cool, if not cooler. I will agree with you. <laughs> so um, not everyone has you know land that they can maybe put a wetland on. What what could the the normal person do maybe in their backyard to help some of these amphibians? Sure. So one of the big things, even if, it, you know, so let's say you don't live in a, in a fully urban area. One of the things you can do is convert some of your backyard to prairie grass. Um, and that's good, not just for amphibians. It's good for reptiles. It's good for birds. It's good for small mammals. And, and a lot of the things you'll find this that, you know, just because you're targeting one group of organisms doesn't mean you're not helping other groups. I mean, we find this all the time, that there are benefits to, to multiple groups. Um, and the, the other thing you can do is, is, you know, be appreciative. So even people in urban areas, you know, you say, well, I don't have room to put in a pond or anything else. You know, one of the things if you're interested in, you know, getting your kids into nature, you're more interested if, if you want to see tree frogs, all you got to do, go buy some PVC pipe at Lowe's or Home Depot, like half inch PVC pipe and a couple bungee cords, strap them to any trees you have, you'll likely be able to catch some tree frogs. Um, and you can handle them, it's just fine. Make sure you wash your hands before and after you handle them so you don't have any, any kind of remnant pesticide or chemical or anything. Um, but they won't harm you. Um, they're not going to hurt you. It's a, it's a great way to start. Um, sometimes what we do, I live in suburban St. Louis. I live in St. Charles County and my kids are really into wildlife but we obviously can't do a lot of that. But we still get toads coming through and so what we'll do is just dig a shallow hole and put a kitty wading pool in there and so toads will come in and it gives them little stopover points um, and so they you know and they might use it for reproduction and if they do then you've got to be cognizant of that keep water in there so those those little guys can come out but half the time they're just they're using those as stepping stones across the landscape. Um, and so you can do little things like that. One of the biggest things that that you don't even need a yard to do to get, um, you know, make an impact is through citizen science, through things like iNaturalist, and there's a, a an amphibian and reptile specific program called Herp Mapper. And it's something you can download on your mobile phone and anytime you're out taking a walk, doesn't matter where you are, you can take a picture of the critter, it will upload that and so we know exactly where that animal was and what it is and what its location was. And people say, well, do you really use that? Well, we do. So um, I mentioned my colleagues, uh, Chris Phillips and Andy Coons, were actually finishing uh, a new edition of a field guide for Illinois amphibians and reptiles. And one of the things that we did was go through Hurt Mapper and iNaturalist to update county records. So we have a better idea of distribution of animals across the landscape. And so, again, it's something really easy to do. You're out taking a nature walk and you see a green frog sitting along the pond, take a picture of it, upload it, and you're done. Um, and those are great, great programs to get involved with. If you see animals that you don't know what they are, take pictures of them. You can email folks like me. You can email folks like Chris Phillips at the Natural History Survey. We all trade these back and forth. So we get photos from the public all the time. Say, hey, I saw this in my yard. Do you know what it is? And we can tell them what it is. And we're happy to do it. Um, and, and again, that goes you know, with that hurt mapper thing. You take a picture of it, you don't know what it is. You can still upload that and you can get help with identifications um, of those critters. And so those are really simple ways for people that they can get involved that really make a big difference because there are only so many researchers in the state of Illinois that work on amphibians and reptiles. And we can't be everywhere um, all the time. And so having other people out there on the ground um, at all times of the year really, really helps us. And we're constantly amazed that, you know, we'll get, we'll get photos in places where we had absolutely no idea that there were populations of a particular organism. 
Uh, people would think at this point we should know everything about every, you know, every animal that is around us in a place like the U.S., and we, and we don't. Um, we're still describing new species in this country um, of vertebrates. A, a colleague of mine described a new genus um, of salamander out in the Southern Appalachian Mountains less than 10 years ago. Not a new species, a new genus. Um, so there are lots of things people can do, but start small and then you can work your way up. Thank you. So one of our big pushes um, with kind of our BioBlitz weekend is to get people using iNaturalist. So thank you for mentioning that. And, and it's great to know that scientists are using that data that, um, you know, we're, we're gathering all the time, no matter where we are. It's critically important. And we're not the only group. I mean, we, we have all sorts of colleagues and other that work on other taxa. The, those data are used. Um, they're, they're really, really important in this day and age. It helps us, like I said, it helps us with distributions, but it also helps us identify trends quicker. Uh, and again, that's because we can't be everywhere at once. But, you know, if we start to see, because people are pretty regular in how they, they use these, these programs and, and where they go and, and where they take their hikes. And so it's, it's, it's really cool. And the more people that use it, the, the better the information is. And that's really, that's really what we need to conserve, not just amphibians and reptiles, but to conserve biodiversity in general. Um, there's never too much data. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are going to encourage um, a family to go out and maybe find you know, salamanders or frogs or maybe even snakes, um, where would you send them? Where would, where would you have them start looking? So the best place in Illinois, and so it'd be a nice little daytime trip, would be to Southern Illinois. Um, and the reason I say Southern Illinois, we, we have far, a uh, far greater number of species in Southern Illinois than we do Northern Illinois. Uh, and the reason that is, is because you get a convergence of habitats. So one of the things that folks don't realize, in Southern Illinois, we have this unique habitat type called bald cypress tupelo swamps. Bald cypress tupelo swamps are indicative of the southeastern portion of the U.S., but they actually hit the very southern portion uh, of, southern, of southern Illinois. And so with that, you get a lot of unique species. And so you'll get really cool critters like mud snakes and um, cottonmouths and all sorts of good stuff like that. The best place to go in southern Illinois, it's on U.S. Forest Service property. It's called Snake Road. Um, and Snake Road is part of the Pine Hills Research Area um, in southern Illinois. And so if you just drive Route three, going south, you will get to Snake Road. Now, the interesting thing about Snake Road is that road is actually closed to traffic in the spring and fall for amphibian and reptile migrations into and out of the swamps and up into the bluffs. And so you can go down there and you'll, you can turn some rocks over and see a whole host of salamanders. If you do that, if you turn rocks or you turn logs, make sure you replace them um, after you've turned them. Make sure that the animal you put under that particular uh, rock or log you turned after you replace it. So don't flip the rock back over on the, on the critter. Um, but you do need to be careful. So there are three species of venomous snakes there. There are copperheads, there are cottonmouths, and there are timber rattlesnakes. Um, none of which will attack you, none of which will chase you. And, and you can just walk along the road and you might see a cotton mouth sitting there. It will simply open its mouth and gape. You can walk right around it. And once you have, it will go on about its business. Um, but there's a huge amount of diversity there. You, you can see all sorts of different snakes, um, salamanders, frogs. If you're a little squeamish, if you're a little worried about snakes, um, the best thing to do if you want to see salamanders or frogs, you can go to the same place, go earlier in the season. And so if you go in February and March, that's when those uh, uh, salamanders and frogs will start getting active. The snakes are still in their hibernacula. Uh, they won't really won't start coming out until the end of March, beginning of April, uh, before they'll start moving out of the, the bluffs and then down, down into the swamps. Um, but it's a fantastic place. It's not the only place in Southern Illinois. Uh, really any state or federal property. Uh, if you, you go out onto those nature trails, you are likely to run into some snakes that'll be out and about. And if you flip some rocks and logs, you're likely gonna turn over some, some salamanders and some, some frogs uh, to check out. So uh, we, we, we have a really, really nice 
um, hidden gem in this state that I wish more people knew about or took advantage of because you can camp um, down there in both state and federal lands. You can tent camp, you can take your RV. Um, there are plenty of other recreational opportunities like fishing and, and certain types of hunting. So it's really a, a, a nice uh, place to get into um, in the state of Illinois. So, yeah, I just saw the other day that they closed Snake Road to um, car traffic just recently. So that migration is underway. Correct. They close at the beginning of September um, and it will go into October before they'll reopen it again. Uh, and so it's, it's so Snake Road is you could walk the entire thing. It's only gosh, a couple of miles. Um, so we're not talking about something that, you know, goes forever. Uh, but it's a really, really neat thing to do, and that's a great time. Once they have those those gates closed, there are parking parking areas on on both sides of the gate, so it doesn't matter um, where you go in from, and you know you can walk as far as little uh, as you want. But it's a it's a really neat place. Um, you know, typically you'll see a fair number of people there, but it's never super, super crowded. Uh, although that is the place that, you know, people that are what we call herp nerds. And so I would fall into that category even before I started down this path for a career. It's something I would do to go out and, and see those animals and, and take photographs of those animals. That's where you'll see a lot of those folks. And so even if you're out there and you're not super knowledgeable, it's likely that somebody around probably is. Uh, and it's probably not their first time there. So it's a really cool place. Most people are super, super nice um, when you're down there, very respectful um, of the area. And so again, yeah, it's a cool place to visit. Uh, and makes for a nice little day trip. Very good. Definitely somewhere I want to go visit sometime soon. Um, so as we wrap up, um, again, thank you so much, John. It was great talking to you and learning about your research and what we can do to help some of these reptiles and amphibians. Um, if people want to learn more, you have a website, correct? I do. Um, you could simply go to Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D, lab, L-A-B, that's all one word, dot Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y, dot com. And you can also find that straight off of the NGREC website, which is just N-G-R-R-E-C dot O-R-G, NGREC dot org. And so you can find me either way. Um, and so again, I would strongly encourage anybody that has questions out there, um, you can find my email address on the website. Um, if you find something, you've got pictures of something, you've got questions, email me. And I'm happy to answer them. Um, I usually try to get back to those emails within a week or so. Sometimes it takes me a little bit longer, so be patient with me. Uh, but we're always happy to answer any questions the public has um, about these really cool critters. Perfect. Well, thank you for all that you do and have a wonderful rest of your week. Absolutely, thanks for having me on and good luck with the uh, bio blitz in the COVID times. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great day, bye. You too, thank you.